episode, I spoke to Professor Curie, a Henry Putnam economist from Princeton. We spoke about her work on childhood development. Here's what you can expect to learn from this video. The most effective ways to support children, along with an analysis of different programs, how they work, and the benefits and disadvantages of them. We talked about how different countries support children, and also ways in which social policy changes can be made faster. And finally, we also talked about the impact of environmental issues on children. And I hope you enjoyed the video! Um, when should support start for children? Is it at preschool or an earlier age or later? Uh, definitely at an earlier age and uh, perhaps it should start with their mothers before their mothers even get pregnant optimally. There's a lot of literature showing that things that happen while children are in utero uh, affect their future life. And certainly the, the first year of life is one of really rapid brain, brain development. So things that happen then really matter as well. And uh, while preschool is also important, uh, there's a lot of children who even by the time they're three years old have a lot of deficits that will um, take effort to make up. Thank you for that. Um, what kind of support has shown to give the best economic results? Does this change as the child grows older? So there's a lot of research showing that many different types of support can be helpful. So there's food and nutrition programs, there's monetary support for the household, also, health insurance or access to health care is extremely important, starting, as I was pointing out, in the pregnancy period and going forward. Um, there's a little bit less evidence about housing assistance, just because it hasn't been studied as much. But since that's so important in family budgets, that seems like it probably makes a difference as well. Uh, so all of these things uh, have been shown to be very cost effective in the sense that the benefits of investing in early childhood are very large and larger than most other types of social programs. But I don't think it's very easy to say which one is the most important. We sort of need all of the above. Now, in terms of... Uh, whether children need different types of support as they get older. I think they, they definitely do. Uh, some types of health care become more important than others. So for example, say adolescents may be more likely to start having mental health problems rather than physical health problems. Uh, and so the kind of mix of things that they need may be different, but, you know, qualitatively, all children need housing, food, medical care, education, uh, and so on. Um, could you contrast the American system with other countries that have greater or lesser social nets? Yes, so we know that uh, a lot of European countries, for example, have much more extensive social safety nets. You can see one kind of stark reflection of that is much lower infant mortality rates than in the US, uh, also lower child mortality rates, and much more equality in mortality rates. Uh, so in the US, it's the case that mortality rates for children are systematically higher in poor areas than in richer areas. And in many European countries, that, that's not true at all. The poor places have very low mortality as well as the rich places, which I think reflects the uh, strength of the safety net. Um, is there any, there must be some 
not criticism, but opinions that, and if we were to do a cost benefit analysis of helping children, would it be that the, impro um, the improvements in the long run are um, able to justify the spending at an early age? Yes, there actually has been a very nice and uh, comprehensive analysis of uh, what the data says about a lot of different types of social programs um, by a person at Harvard called Nathaniel Hendren. And so he sort of analyzed them all in the same format so that you could compare and the really striking thing that he finds is that the returns are really high for programs for young children. And there's different ways to measure the returns. So one, one way that people do it sometimes is to say, well, let's just consider the costs and benefits to the government, right? So if the government pays for the program, do they get back all the money that they spend or not. Um, so a, a lot of these programs actually pass that kind of test because they have so many benefits and you know the children grow up healthier, they get better jobs, they pay more taxes, you know, which is a benefit to the government. Now that's not the only way to try and think about this. You could think, well, you know, if people are healthier and happier, that has a benefit itself, and we should try and value that as well. And then, of course, if you add those kinds of benefits to the citizens, then the benefit is even greater. Okay. Um, and this type of policy sounds like it, it, not a slow process, but the time to see the benefits would take quite a few years. Um, so, and also, to pass policies seems like a slow process. So in what ways do you feel these issues can be better understood by politicians and the public to improve more quickly? That's a great question. I sort of wish I knew a really good answer for that one. Um, I think that as a sort of social scientists and advocates, the only thing that you can do is keep putting the information out there. Uh, politics kind of works at its own speed and has its own priorities. And sometimes things that you're working on kind of suddenly rise to the top of the priority list. Uh, and I have lots of examples of that from my own work. Uh, I did some of the early work on Head Start, the preschool program for poor children in the United States. At the time I did it, nobody was very interested. Uh, and then Bill Clinton got elected and they greatly expanded the, the size of the program. So the fact that the work was there for people to use was helpful. Similarly, with the Affordable Care Act, I was in 2014, way back in the early 2000s, I had done some work looking at the effects of health insurance expansions, earlier health insurance expansions on children, and shown that there were these big positive effects and that it reduced infant mortality. And then that work, you know, was used to make a case for the, the ACA. So you sort of put the work out there, and then whether it gets used or not is not uh, something that's totally under your control and sometimes it does sometimes it doesn't and sometimes it just takes a really long time okay um and in the u.s and i guess in other countries is there a further dimension to supportive underprivileged families from ethnic minorities well in the u.s it's pretty systematic that children who are from minority groups as well as children who are poor do worse on almost every outcome. And the, the flip side of that though is that when you have a program, typically they benefit the most from the program. Uh, so that's an important thing to keep in mind that a lot of these deficits are kind of social choices in the sense that if 
we chose to invest in the kids, then there wouldn't be such big gaps in the outcomes. Oh, okay. Um, and then another question, um, research area I know you have worked on is environmental issues and how they can affect um, child development. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, that uh, actually dovetails very well with a lot of the things that I've been talking about. So uh, my work on environmental health shows that exposure to a lot of different kinds of pollution in utero has effects on the babies who are born, uh, increases the probability of preterm labor, increases the probability of low birth weight, and those things themselves are linked to all sorts of other future problems like low birth weight babies are more likely to have ADHD, they're more likely to have asthma, they're more likely to have other types of, of problems. So some of the things that have been shown to impact babies in that way are uh, living close to busy roads, so, so uh, air pollution from cars, living close to factories that emit toxic pollutants, living close to hazardous waste sites, um, just living in, in places with a lot of air pollution, living in housing that has lead paint. So there are many different types of environmental exposures that people could have. And then uh, the other sort of important piece of this is that poor people and minorities are more likely to live in places that have all of those things. So everything that I've studied, whether it's super fun sites or toxic releases, uh, especially black, less educated mothers are more likely to be exposed to those things than other mothers. And so you can compute for each one of these things. Well, if it leads to this much of a difference in birth weight, then how much of the future deficits that you see might be due to differences in environmental exposures. And it's a considerable amount. So it, it definitely contributes to intergenerational inequality. Okay. Um, is it possible to do a, a, like a deep dive into a cost-benefit analysis of four different programs? So the first one is financial aid. Um, the second one is food support. The third one is health care. And the last one is housing. Okay, well, if you wanted to really deep dive, then I should have had uh, like notes on those things because I don't remember any of the, the exact numbers off the top of my head. Um, but financial aid, there's a lot of different types of financial aid programs. So one of the things that where there's been a lot of discussion has been about what are called conditional cash transfers. Uh, so an example of that would be like the Mexican Progressa program. Uh, there's a similar one in Brazil. A lot of countries have these programs. And so the conditionality is that the parents are supposed to uh, send the kids to school or take them to a clinic regularly. And then in return for that, they get a, a cash amount, which is a typically reasonably large compared to their usual income. And so those programs have been extensively studied uh, and found to have positive effects. And then the question is, well, is that because of the conditionality? Is that because you're paying people to send their kids to school? Um, and I think the answer to that question is probably not. It's probably just the cash because most of the time the conditionality isn't very strictly enforced anyway. Um, so, so people are getting this cash transfer and it allows them to um, you know, solve a lot of problems and <laughs> improve their children's lives. Um, in the US, we have a program which essentially is a cash transfer it's administered through the tax system, and it's similar to a program that they have in, in Great Britain. Um, and so the idea is that if you work and have 
low income, there's a credit and you get paid the credit um, and you get a bigger credit the more that you work up to some maximum. So it's supposed to encourage parents to work as well as giving them extra money so that if they work, they, they won't be poor. Uh, and that program has been shown to improve children's birth weights, but also their schooling outcomes uh, and, and also mother's mental health. So you can see if you weren't worrying about money all the time, then your mental health might be a lot better, which is in turn good for the kids. So that's cash transfers. Um, what was the second one that you mentioned? Food support. Okay, so food support, again, there's a lot of different kinds of food support, and some of them are uh, kind of more con conditional or restrictive than others. So in the United States, there's a program that used to be called the Food Stamp Program, and it's now called the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program which gives people essentially like a debit card that they can spend on groceries and they can buy pretty much any kind of groceries that they want. So there's no restriction that you have to buy healthy food. Uh, but that has been shown in some studies that looked at the rollout of the program to have positive effects for, for pregnant women and children and also that children who were affected by the program grew up healthier and were less likely to have metabolic syndrome, which is a cluster of things like high blood pressure, diabetes, and so on that are associated with poor nutrition in childhood. Um, other types of programs are more restrictive, like there's another program that's called the Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children. And that gives people as well kind of coupons that they can use to buy food, but they can only buy certain food. So they're only supposed to be able to buy nutritious food. And they also have to go and get um, checkups and nutrition education and so on. That program has been shown to have pretty large effects on the health of uh, newborns. Uh, which might be because of the other parts that are packaged along with it, the medical care and the nutrition assistance. Um, so there, there's, there's positive evidence in favor of nutrition programs as well, but there's different kinds of nutrition programs which have differing sizes of effects. Okay, um, the next one is Healthcare. Okay, so health healthcare is actually one of the things that I've spent the most time on, and I, I think it's really a, a very interesting one because it has such large effects, and they are um, over such a long period of time. Um, the thing about health is that a lot of health conditions that adults have are related to things that happened to them when they were children. So if you have poor conditions when you're a child, you're more likely to have health problems as an adult. Uh, and you can see that, you know, even to children who benefited from the Clean Air Act in the sense that when they were very small, the air quality in the place where they live improved a lot are less likely when they're adults, say 30, 35 years later, to be disabled. You know, so you can see these sort of dramatic uh, differences that are related to health in childhood. And I think a lot of the health inequalities that we see among adults, and things like you know, poor people have lower life expectancy, Black people in the United States have much lower life expectancy than white people. I think a lot of that is related to differences in the health and health care that they received at a young age. Uh, so that is really one of the most important things that everybody has access to appropriate basic health care. Okay. Um, and the last program, no program, uh, is housing. 
so housing, as I mentioned, I think there's some there's less evidence about housing. Um, just trying to think what the best evidence is. There is evidence from from demolitions of public housing projects where they moved, um, you know, they blew up housing projects in the United States because they had such a bad reputation and then moved people to to other places. Um, that seems, as far as I know, to have relatively little effect on the kids. I guess the best known example is something called the Moving to Opportunities Program. And so what that did was it took people who were living in public housing projects and um, gave them vouchers to pay for rent in other neighborhoods. And there were sort of two flavors of these vouchers. So one flavor was, we just give you a voucher and you can move anywhere you like. And the other one was, we'll give you a voucher, but you have to move to a lower poverty place than where you're living right now. And uh, so the, the question then was, does moving to a lower poverty place improve children's outcomes? And the answer turned out to be a little complicated because it was, yes, it improves your outcomes if you're young when you move. But if you're a teenager when you move, it doesn't seem to really improve your outcomes. So that suggested that the housing assistance, uh, at least in the form of allowing people to move to better neighborhoods, would have a much bigger effect if it was at young ages than if it was at older ages. That's really interesting. Um, I think you mentioned that housing had a bad reputation in the US. Could you explain why that is? housing projects? Yeah. Oh. Uh, well, uh, housing projects in the US, they're a little bit like the ones that you hear about outside Paris. You know, very large. The police may be afraid to go there at all. Uh, no social services. Isolated from kind of amenities of the city um, and, you know, not just not very uh, attractive places to live. Like have the main reason why people signed up in the moving to opportunities program to get vouchers was because of crime. They, they were afraid and they wanted to live in a lower crime neighborhood. And so the, so public housing projects, you know, they don't have to be bad, but if they don't get any services and they're not policed and you just have a lot of people living there, then they're not going to be very good places to live. Um, is there any claim to the idea that by putting a price ceiling or any other kind of like lowering the rent of houses that it would create a shortage or like people breaking the rules and selling the rent for higher anyway because of increased demand? Um, well, I think there's lots of evidence that that happens. I was just thinking in New York, there was recently a big storm uh, and people actually drowned in basement apartments, which were illegal basement apartments. <laughs> but, you know, people were still living there because that's all they could afford. Um, so, you know, solving the housing pro problem, I think is quite difficult. Um, the, the vouchers, um, have been studied and there seems to be less evidence that those cause problems in the sense, you know, people can move wherever they want. If you give them a little bit more money in order to move to a better place then they can take advantage of that to move to a better place. Okay, and this will be my final question. Since um, 
providing support to children is such a complex um, problem because so many factors are involved. Um, is there any preferred structure as to who, like what roles does the government play? Does do private organizations play? Do international organizations play and do like individual people play? That's a great question. I, I mean, in wealthy European countries, the government plays a big role, right? The government provides health care, the government provides education. Um, in a lot of cases, they provide subsidized daycare for children who are too young for education. Uh, they also provide housing assistance, you know, which is of, of decent quality. So in those kinds of settings, the, the government is really doing a lot of the, the work and it seems to work reasonably well in terms of providing a, a safety net. Um, of course, you know, parents always have a responsibility to do as well as they can and most parents arguably are trying to do the best they can with what they've got, um, which may not always be very much. So it's hard to leave all the responsibility on the, the parents. Um, now, where do organizations fit? Uh, I think private organizations can be very helpful, uh, particularly in sort of highlighting areas where things aren't working or where more work is needed. In international settings, the, the government sometimes isn't really in a very good uh, place to do uh, as much as they would like to do. But I think it's still important for international organizations to work with the local governments and not, uh, not go off completely on their own, doing their own thing uncoordinated. Um, that will not result in building capacity for the government to eventually be able to do it themselves. Okay, well, that's it for my questions. Thank you so much for making the time to talk to me. It was wonderful to hear your thoughts. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Good questions. So in the conversation we just heard, we learned about different policies, including financial aid, food support, health care, and housing. We also learned about how um, there are layers to underprivileged children, for example, in ethnic minorities and also in the places they live when it comes to environmental issues and how that affects children. Um, I want to hear your thoughts on this. If you have any information or thoughts related to the topic, please leave it in the comments down below. And thank you for watching. Thank <music> you.